This really was a throwback and historic Tesla quarter, one in which Tesla exceeds basically all expectations across multiple business lines and proves that Tesla is unmatched when it comes to continually reducing costs while continuing to grow the business and delivering more value to the customer. Rather than talking in platitudes though, I want to dive right into breaking down some of the data. We'll start with autonomy because that's still the most important part of the story for the next few years. Elon and Ashok made some comments about improvements to FSD when it comes to miles per intervention or MPI. Honestly, I think it's fair to not put too much weight into these forecasts because it is pretty arbitrary from our point of view and Elon is notorious for being too optimistic with FSD, but in this case, what Ashok said may give us some great insight. He said Tesla has already made a 100x improvement with FSD version 12.5 when comparing to where Tesla was at the beginning of this year. At that time, most of the fleet was still on version 11, but 12.1.2 was the first version to begin rolling out to limited customers at the end of January. So if you can recall back to your drives around that time, Tesla has seen with its private internal MPI data a 100x improvement. I think this is a critical distinction because people hear these comments on calls and probably think, oh wow, FSD is 100 times better than it was earlier this year. And I think we would all agree it's made good progress, but it's not like the experience is 100 times better, it's just that whatever data Tesla is tracking internally, that number is 100 times better. It's worth trying to grasp this because Ashok then also said that with version 13, they're expecting a 1000x improvement from January this year on the production release software. Elon confirmed the same thing, saying at least three orders of magnitude improvement for this year as a whole, which is really just another way of saying a 1000x improvement. And these statements together would imply a rough 10x improvement from where Tesla is today with version 12.5. Again, that's because version 12.5 was a 100x improvement from earlier this year. But on that point, Elon said he's expecting a five or six fold improvement in MPI relative to 12.5 with version 13. So again, not that the experience is necessarily going to feel five to 10 times better, but Tesla's MPI data, whatever it really is, will be five to 10 times better with version 13 compared to 12.5, which yes, is a notable increase, but it's less than the increase Tesla has seen year to date. I think reading between the lines is important on these calls. This time around, Elon was eager to talk. He was quite chipper and actually interrupted his teammates multiple times, but an engaged, confident, upbeat Elon is a great indication of where things are headed. I think if there was one chart to explain the team's confidence with FSD going forward and starting driverless rides next year, it's this one. I plotted each FSD version 12 release to align with the amount of compute that Tesla had installed at the time. Keep in mind, when a version is released, that means it's already been training for a few weeks or months prior to the release. So the current level of compute for each release is less relevant than the amount of compute in the months leading up to that release. One key takeaway is that it likely won't be until a dot release of version 13, if not even version 14, where Tesla Tesla will actually be utilizing all of its future planned capacity. I think we'd all agree version 12.3 was a big jump from version 11, which makes sense because in the months leading up to that release, Tesla had significantly more training capacity online. Version 12.5 has been a minor improvement for some, but again, this makes sense given the training capacity was flatlined for the time between 12.3 and 12.5. So those improvements may have had more to do with training optimization and weightings than extra compute capacity. So it's really not hard to see why the team's so excited about version 13, given that the timing of this release is likely to be trained on an extra 30,000 or so H100 equivalents relative to what 12.5 was trained with. 
So all of this combined is why the team is so confident that in quarter two or Q3 of next year, Tesla's MPI data will surpass that of a human. Exactly what this means is still somewhat of a mystery, but if Tesla can deploy paid driverless rides in Texas and California, the perception of the company will undoubtedly change because Tesla's path to scaling to other states will only be limited by regulations given Tesla is producing many times more autonomous vehicles per week compared to Waymo's in entire fleet. And sorry about Tuesday, I spent all day researching and then two hours recording only to realize my audio recorder was off and then I closed the tabs and all of my notes in reader mode were also gone. But an important part of what a Palo Alto council member said about the possible partnership with Tesla deploying cyber cabs for ride hailing was that Tesla may be able to use the license or the permit that the Palo Alto Link service already has, which could fast track things for Tesla. There's still a lot of uncertainty to hear, but the fact that we're hearing about specific cities and specific licensing is very encouraging. By the way, that Palo Alto link only goes intersection to intersection, not destination to destination. And it only has about 10 vehicles in the fleet, four of which I believe are Teslas. But the costs are too high and the funding is running out for that program. We also learned Tesla is already operating the ride hail network in the Bay Area for employees with a safety driver and have been testing that for about one year. So Tesla's already using and refining the ride hail app. I do think a quick glimpse of this would have been great to share on 1010, but less than 12 months from now, and we may get to see the real deal with the public. The last few things on autonomy, Elon said the take rate for FSD has improved substantially after the 1010 event. Tesla's never going to become a company focused on advertising, but hopefully this serves as an incentive for them to get the message out there more about what Tesla vehicles are capable of. Elon confirmed if a hardware three vehicle turns out not to be powerful enough for unsupervised FSD, Tesla will provide a free upgrade computer replacement. Tesla doesn't yet know if they can push version three far enough to get it there, but they're definitely going to try to avoid that expense. Hopefully this calms those fears for hardware three owners, although I'd still expect that upgrade to be years away. A big distinction, Elon said the CyberCab should hit volume production in 2026, not just that it'll start production in 2026. That's significantly more bullish than what he said at the We Robot event. The team is clearly pumped about the new manufacturing methods for the CyberCab and the much faster cycle time Times, which could be around five times better than a normal auto factory. Volume production for Tesla is usually around 5,000 units per week. So if Tesla can pull that off for the CyberCab, that would be a run rate of 250,000 units in 2026. Not that they produce that many in 2026, but they could exit 2026 having hit that run rate. And eventually they plan to do 2 million CyberCabs per year, maybe up to 4 million per year. I'm also very thankful Elon and the team made it abundantly clear the cyber cab will not ever have a wheel or pedals. They said that would be pointless, silly, and at odds with what Tesla believes. We said this on the channel after the 1010 event because both Lars and Franz said the same thing, but plenty of people in the community did not listen, but now hopefully that argument and line of thinking should be dead. On the semi, we got official confirmation that all of the semis already produced do have the hardware for FSD and they're currently training with that fleet which is a statement that's easy to gloss over with everything else going on, but this is obviously a massive deal given the economics of the Tesla Semi and transporting goods. It really should not be hard to see how a Tesla Semi with unsupervised FSD is going to totally blow up the goods transportation game. And sure, that's likely still a few years down the line, but that's absolutely where this is all headed. And just a sidebar, if you want to know why people often talk past each other today, this is it. I found this one article that over 400 sources reported on. 40% of that reporting came from the left and only 24% came from the right. But compare the headlines. On the left, one outlet framed the indictment by arguing the Supreme Court will unjustly give Trump immunity, and on the right, Republican Senator Rick Scott called the indictment election interference. So depending on which article people see first, their view of the story will be completely different. And how is seeing all of that data possible? 
If you guys need a gift idea with the holidays around the corner, a subscription to the Ground News Vantage plan would be an excellent option for anybody that likes to stay informed without media bias. Ground News does sponsor the channel, but with the election right around the corner, this has become an invaluable tool for me. Ground News does not use these manipulative algorithms and they're affiliated with zero corporate media or tech companies. The My News Bias feature gives you a real-time snapshot into all of the different articles that you're reading. For every article you read, you get these tags telling you who actually owns that source, the factuality level of that source, and again, the political leaning. And with one click, it'll take you direct to that source. Plus, the blind spot feed will show you what stories are being disproportionately reported by either side. I know a lot of you have already signed up for the Vantage plan, which gives you unlimited access. So if you'd like to support a company doing what I believe is very important work in this day and age, you can get 40% off the Vantage plan at ground.news slash electrify or you can use the QR code right on the screen. Real quick on the more affordable vehicles, yes, plural, Elon said more affordable models and lower cost vehicles multiple times. But before everybody gets giddy here, the other comments the team made have it sounding like it may be more of a lower priced entry level Model 3 or Y, a more limited variant of those vehicles, more so than an entirely new vehicle. The word is at least some version in the new model lineup will be under $30,000, but that's with incentives. So these new models may still start above $35,000, and I'm not expecting anything close to a starting price of $25,000. That's the cyber cab and that will use a fully unboxed process on separate manufacturing lines. These new models next year are on existing lines. One more reason to think it's just new variants of the 3 and Y. Plus, we heard Elon rant about how heroic it is to reduce 20% of the cost from an existing vehicle, which to me is clearly what they've been trying to do for this new affordable variant reduce 20% of the cost from the 3 and Y. The cheapest Model 3 is about $42,500, minus the $7,500 credit, takes it to $35,000, and then 80% of that would be $28,000. So if Tesla reduced 20% of the cost from the base Model 3, you can see how with the same structure, they can sell a new base variant under $30,000 after incentives and keep a similar margin profile. So I know it's not as exciting as an entirely new product, but it'll certainly increase the total addressable market for Tesla and should serve as a perfect bridge until the CyberCab is ready for production the following year. Don't forget, the Model Y was unveiled in March 2019 and then entered production in January of 2020. That's about a 10 month timeline. And we're already only eight months away from June of next year. So that's just one more anecdote leading me to believe this will be more of a new entry level type variant than an entirely new product. Hopping to the financials, just a few takeaways here. Of course, the Cybertruck hitting gross margin profitability for the first time is a great sign. We'll see if they can sustain this, offering the $80,000 variant now into quarter four. But to hit this metric after customer deliveries only began November of last year, so about 11 months ago, with so many new manufacturing techniques and so much of the electrical architecture being new, which requires a new supply chain, I think that's incredibly impressive and means great things for Cybertruck profitability long-term. The auto gross margin X credit figure came in at 17.1%, well ahead of expectations. And there was some talk about this being inflated thanks to Tesla recognizing $326 million in the quarter for deploying FSD to the Cybertruck and smart summon to the rest of the fleet. And let's assume all of this revenue flows through as profit. The good news is even if you take this number out entirely from Tesla's automotive gross profit, which I don't think is a rational argument, but to make it anyway, the auto gross margin X credit figure would still have been 15.4%, which would be up from 14.6% in quarter three. In the 10Q that Tesla already released this morning, they recognized $711 million of deferred revenue for the first three quarters of this year. That means 300 
$185 million was recognized across quarter one and quarter two, which is an average of $192 million per quarter. So this number will certainly fluctuate and the quarter three recognition was materially higher than quarter one and quarter two. But if we just normalize this number, recognizing the average from quarter one and quarter two of 192 million instead of the 326 million actually recognized, the auto gross margin X credits would have been 16.4% and the Wall Street expectation was 14.9%. So basically what I'm trying to say is no matter how you slice this, this was a great number. Going forward, Vibov did say it's going to be tough to maintain these margins in quarter four given macro challenges. So we should not be expecting a significant increase here despite the expectations for Tesla having its best delivery quarter ever this quarter four. As we highlighted, it's likely the deferred revenue recognition comes back down to normalized levels in quarter four as well. One metric everyone should track because it's the one that Tesla has said they're optimizing for is operating margin. That came in at 10.8%, the highest since quarter one of 2023 and up from the 6.3% in quarter two this year. If we normalize that a bit and add back the $55 million in restructuring charges, that number jumps to 11%. So it looks like Tesla has already taken the brunt of the hit from the mass layoffs and has moved into the phase where it's beginning to realize the benefits of lower personnel operating expenses. The highest this number has ever been was quarter one of 2022 when it hit 19.2%. It'll likely take a few years to approach that figure again, even with Tesla Energy achieving record margins of 30.5% in quarter three. As we've talked about, a lot of this margin does flow directly to operating profit in part because Tesla Energy has lower operating expenses relative to automotive. A fun fact, the highest gross margin Tesla ever achieved with the auto business was 32.9% in quarter one of 2022 and the highest X regulatory credits was the same quarter at 30%. So X credits, this Tesla energy gross margin is higher than Tesla ever achieved on the auto side without regulatory credits. This will fluctuate as deployments and recognition of inventory is volatile with the timing, but over time, Tesla called out they expect margins to continually improve for Tesla energy. The margin may dip a bit as well when the mega pack factory in Shanghai begins to ramp and some of of those costs are recognized, but they should be able to ramp output there even faster than they did in Lathrop, helping to offset that. But with record cash on hand, a new record low cost per vehicle, regulatory credit revenues continuing to come in at an increased pace, already over $2 billion for this year. And looking at this chart from the lovely Alexandra, this figure is still growing annually and not shrinking like so many people predicted years ago. We have auto gross margins, X credits, going back up even after adjusting for the deferred revenue recognition. Operating margin is the highest it's been in six quarters and free cash flow was the highest it's been in two years. So clearly Tesla's in a very strong financial position given they implied even greater deliveries in quarter four. On that note, they're expecting slight volume growth over last year, which was 1,808,581 units in 2023. So far this year, Tesla's delivered 1,293,656 3,656 vehicles, which means Tesla would need to deliver 514,926 units in quarter four to sell one more vehicle than last year, which could be defined as slight growth. If they pull that off, that would be the first time in Tesla's history delivering over 500,000 units in a quarter. The current high watermark is 484,507, which was in quarter four of 2023. Assuming Tesla does achieve slight volume growth this year, the top of Elon's sales growth forecast for next year is 30%, so the bullish delivery guess for 2025 is 2,351,150. 55 units. Even if we use the 20% growth on the lower end of his prediction, that's still 2,170,298, significantly ahead of the Wall Street consensus, which will likely be adjusted up in the weeks ahead, pushing earnings per share expectations higher in the process. So all of this, given that we're still technically in this in-between growth wave phase, this is about as good of a quarter as you can ask for as a Tesla investor at this point. As Elon said, Tesla's basically winning 
at everything it's doing. The only not so great update was the sentiment around the Roadster and how the design is not finalized yet. And while that will be a really fun product and it'll generate some buzz, it was never going to move the needle for the stock or for profits. So the timeline for that is still pretty unclear. But the 4680 cell now has a clear path to being the most competitive cell from a dollars per kilowatt hour standpoint in North America in the near future, which is incredibly astounding for a car company to do in-house in just a few years. Hopefully this report will serve as a wake-up call to the loud cohort that has grown impatient and frustrated with Tesla. There really is just no way Legacy Auto can compete with Tesla given their decades of structural inefficiencies trying to compete in this new AI and software driven electric future. We may have another few quarters where the results aren't groundbreaking, but it's becoming clear as day that within the next 12 to 24 months, this may start feeling like the good old days of Tesla back in 2020. Not even for the stock per se, as that can be weighed down by macro factors and other things, but I'm talking about Tesla printing incredible gross margins margin numbers on the foundation of elite continual cost reduction. Tesla's approaching a trillion dollar company status and it still runs like a startup. This really just can't be touched by any auto company and even for other tech companies, Tesla is in a league of its own when it comes to solving real world AI with some of the largest supercomputer buildouts in the world. There's a reason that today Tesla stock was up over 21%, up $46.83 per share, which adds around a hundred $150 billion in market cap in one day. This was a big sentiment shifter for Tesla the company and Tesla the stock, and this really is just heading toward the exit of the no growth in between phase. It sounds like we'll be back to delivery growth next year, Tesla Energy is crushing it, Cortex is continually adding capacity, and FSD may make some very significant improvements with version 13 and dot releases thereafter, which is expected to allow those drivers rides next year. Optimus can always surprise as well, but even without anything from Optimus for a few years, as Vibov said, the future is looking incredibly bright for Tesla. I know some people out there sold shares ahead of earnings given the negative sentiment, hoping to buy back at a lower price, but there's a reason we've said for years, you have to be careful because in the short term, anything can happen, and Tesla has a history of outperforming expectations. The problem is our culture has a what have you done for me lately mentality nowadays, so too many people were focused on the past few quarters alone and they were lulled to sleep. But Tesla has a way of reasserting its dominance and this is really just a sneak peek of the sentiment that will arise when Tesla does become the most valuable company in the world. And I don't know how long it's going to take, but from everything I can see, we're still squarely on track for that. It was a great quarter from Tesla and truly there are plenty of things to be very excited about in the next 12 months, which yes, is part of why Tesla stock had a historic trading day. I'm still working to confirm this, but previously the big biggest dollar move for Tesla stock in one day was $47.67 back on January 3rd, 2022. So adjusting for the split, this may have just become Tesla's second biggest trading day ever when it comes to dollars per share growth. There's still plenty of work ahead, but days like this most certainly deserve to be celebrated.